slide swords are older than you think. Or are they? Well, there's the problem. Um, side sword is a modern term, okay? I've mentioned this in countless videos, um, but unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, um, it helps us describe a certain type of sword. I'm holding an example here by Cavitan Armory, incidentally, uh, which I've had this for at least a couple of years, I think probably about three years now. Does good service, very good side swords. Um, but in modern HEMA, we refer to side sword, um, but it's a kind of slightly vague term, because what do we mean by side Side sword. Well, again, I've spoken about this in previous videos. Essentially, what most people are applying it to is a sword of the, for the most part, 16th century um, that is a complex hilted, so it's got something more than a simple medieval cross hilt, okay? Um, and it's usually, I think in most people's mind, it's usually got a narrower blade than a medieval arming sword. But that's what I want to talk about, is the fact that actually what this is, is an arming sword, <laughs> okay? So I think what uh, a lot of people need to kind of recalibrate in their brains, and I'm not saying that side sword isn't a, useless, uh, isn't a useful term, it does have a use, I think, in, in modern communication, because when someone says they do side sword, you know that they probably do one of the Bolognese or one of the other Italian sources that specifically look at the use of the sword in the 16th century. Now, in many cases, swords exactly like this, which you would think of as a, this is a 15th century sword, but it's not very different to 14th century swords, very similar actually to some 13th century swords, uh, or and all the way back, so 13th, 14th, 15th century, these types of swords were still being used in the 16th century. Believe it or not, the simple cross hilt was still used in the 17th century in some cases. Uh, but people would have used those swords in the 16th century in a slightly different way to how they used them in the 15th century. The simple fact is that fencing evolved and moved on. And yes, we could argue that in some cases it's chicken and egg, in some cases more complex hilts perhaps changed fencing, or was it that fencing brought in the requirement or the desire for more complex hilts. We don't know. Uh, we don't know. Uh, it, maybe it's just a symbiotic kind of backwards and forwards. But the simple fact is that a medieval arming sword is an object. How it's used is not used in one fixed way. So the way, the way we see uh, a uh, one-handed sword used in Le Kuchner is not exactly the same as a one-handed sword used in Fiore, is not exactly the same as a one-handed sword used in Talhofer, is not the same as a one-handed sword used in Marozzo. Um, uh, so even, even if we're dealing with a similar period, we find difference of use, different techniques. And particularly once we get into the 16th century, there is a greater emphasis on having the weapon held in front of you for more of the time. Not always, and there are lots of guard positions which are back, uh, held backwards, uh, held away from the opponent. Um, but nevertheless, the weapon spends probably, I think most people would agree, compared to medieval systems, more time in front of the person's body. We even have guards that look pretty much exactly like certain sabre guards. If we look in 1536, Opera Nova by uh, Achille Morozzo, for example. So there is a greater tendency towards the weapon being held out in front, and there is arguably a greater emphasis on the use of the point. I think most people would say that. Whether it's actually, strictly speaking, true, hmm, that's a bit debatable, because if we look at medieval uh, longsword sources, 15th century longsword sources, there's actually a really big emphasis on the use of the point. If we look at um, sword and buckler from the 15th century, there's a big emphasis on use of the point. So was there a greater emphasis on the use of the point in Morozzo or Manchilino in the 1530s? Uh, not so sure. Um, one thing you could argue is that because the sword is being held out in front of the person's body more, there, there's more emphasis on cuts uh, from the wrist um, and Molinelli or uh, circular Moulinet type movements. Uh, arguably, rather than uh, full, full arm cuts that we maybe see um, in, in earlier sources. But coming back to the sword, the fact is that this was still an arming sword. If you add a few more bars to it, it's still an arming sword. You could have exactly this blade, and bear in mind that what we're looking at here, the Cavitan one, is a practice sword, so it's actually got a narrower blade than uh, the sharp version would have because it's blunt. Um, but you could absolutely transpose this blade from this arming sword 
down onto the hilt of the Kavitan and everybody in HEMA circles would go, oh, that's a side sword. No argument there. If we look at the uh, Town Guard sword, for example, this example from Windless, um, it's got a broad blade. It's got a big old fat broad uh, blade on it that looks really quite similar to the arming sword because it's an arming sword. Uh, and now some people would call this a rapier. And I, I mean, I wouldn't call that a rapier, but again, the term rapier is, is rather vague and we don't really know exactly what it originally applied to. It's clear that in England, the term rapier um, was applied to quite thrust centric swords because that's what the English sources of the time used that word rapier and also tuck to refer to thrusting swords. But in a, uh, the original purpose of the word, um, which we're not entirely uh, sure what it, uh, where it comes from, but it's probably from espada ropera, probably just means dress sword or robe sword, the one you wear in civilian life rather than the one you carry on the battlefield, possibly. Um, so, quite simply, this, whether it's this or whether it's this, okay, or whether it's this or whether it's this, they are all arming swords. They just, it's just that the ones that we call side sword have some form of more complex hilt on. Now, I'm sure that I've already blown some of your minds. I'm going to blow the rest of the minds with this. So most of you would think of this as a 16th century sword. Well, I know that the real sword fans will know what's coming, but some of you won't know this. This type of hilt Appeared in the 15th century. <laughs> um, now, there are several elements to this hilt. What, what precisely am I talking about? Well, principally, the most obvious things on this are the knuckle bow, the finger rings, okay? They're the principal things. There also, is also this side ring here. The, notice this isn't a main large side ring. This is just linking the two uh, finger rings. Now, something, a bit of news about that. I'm going to show you an example in a minute. But the, the knuckle bow, when did the knuckle bow appear? Well, you could argue with the falcatum, okay? You could argue in ancient times. There have been certain swords throughout history which have had some form of knuckle protection on them. Um, and I'm just talking about Europe. Uh, in fact, if you go to China or India, you can find other examples from way back, okay? But in Europe, by and large, the knuckle bow really starts to gain traction, starts to gain ground in the 15th century. That's right, in the time of long swords and cross-hilted arming swords, sometimes people started putting um, knuckle bows on things. Now, occasionally you find a knuckle bow on an arming sword, um, but perhaps more commonly you find knuckle bows on uh, fa uh, falchions, langmessa, hangers, whatever you want to call them, but these types of single-edged sword. And as I say, sometimes you find them on arming swords as well. So sometimes you get this type of hilt. And now you think about what's the correlation here. Why would you get knuckle bows on those types of sword? Well, those types of sword arguably are being carried more often by more likely equipped troops who can't use gauntlets for one reason or another, or don't want to use gauntlets for one reason or another. Either they can't afford gauntlets or the gauntlets aren't obtainable. Um, for that type of soldier or they're not usable because you're an archer or you're operating guns or artillery you, you can't have gauntlets on your hands all sorts of possible reasons but for your sidearm therefore you want a bit more protection on the front of the hilt and so you have a knuckle bow so knuckle bows start to appear really quite early on in the 15th century so in the early 1400s we start to very occasionally see knuckle bows and as a general tendency as we go nearer to the year 1500, we see knuckle bows more and more often, especially on messers and falchions, okay? So that's the first thing, knuckle bows, and sometimes paired incidentally with a sidebar as well. For example, on the so-called Wakefield hangers, a particular type of English falchion. We'll talk about those another time. Now the finger rings. Again, finger rings are something that are very important to the development of the so-called rapier hilt, um, but they appear in the 15th century. They appear really early in the 15th century. So the earliest examples we know about are swords from the Alexandria arsenal. Now, Alexandria in Egypt was captured by the Ottomans. And so these, most of these things, as I understand it, if I recall correctly, ended up in Istanbul. And from there, they were sold off in auction. So a lot, they're all over the world now there's some in the royal armories there's some in the metropolitan museum of art there's many in private collections they're all over the world but thanks to the ottoman empire they got taken out of egypt and um, and sold to whoever could afford them so 
Some of these swords have knuckle bows, usually just a single knuckle bow uh, in the case of the Alexandria swords, but these swords are dated. Uh, how are they dated, you might ask? Well, they're dated by virtue of the fact that when they were brought into the Alexandria arsenal, they had an Arabic inscription put on them saying, in the year of blah, 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 this sword has been given as a gift um, to the Sultan or whoever, and they put a date on that. And that date's obviously in the Islamic uh, calendar or whatever calendar they were using in Egypt at the time. Can't remember uh, off the top of my head. And we can translate that into a modern date. So in the, in the let's say in the first uh, or first and second quarters of the 15th century, we start to get single knuckle bows. And then we start to see them in art as well. So that by the middle of the 15th century, sometimes and particularly in Spain and Italy, particularly Southern Italy, which was um, very closely uh, controlled and influenced by Spain, um, we start to see these appearing. And by the end of the 1400s, by the year 1500, they're really, really quite common. So. To cut a long story short, we see this as a 16th century sword, but in many ways, it's a 15th century sword that just crosses over into the 16th century and became super popular in the 16th century. But they were around either with or without a nokobo and with or without uh, finger rings, but the, this kind of hilt was around already by the year 1500 and was quite widespread. Okay, so that's the first thing. Second thing is I thought that this uh, little connecting ring here, which connects the ends of the two knuckle bows and gives you a little bit of extra side protection on there. It's actually quite useful, it has quite a big effect and it's very good for binding. It has a similar effect to the nagel with a uh, Langmesser, incidentally. I thought that that was somewhat of a later addition, but literally this morning, relative to when I'm fil filming this video, um, I saw an example of a painting from dated 1500 to 1505 with that clearly shown on it. So already by the year 1500, we've got the beginnings of the extra bars starting to appear on the so-called side sword hilt. So a few things to take away from this video, hopefully. Number one is the fact that arming swords didn't go away and weren't replaced by other things. They just evolved. They just morphed. But sometimes they even stayed as simple cross-hilted swords. So simple cross-hilted swords were still around pretty much through the whole 16th century uh, some of the time, particularly used as battlefield weapons where someone was using gauntlets, for example. If you're a fully armoured uh, man-at-arms in armour in the middle of the, 16, uh, middle of the 1500s, then you, having gauntlets on, you didn't necessarily want a complex hilt. You wanted something that was quick and easy to grab. So this is good. But for people who wanted the extra hand protection, these were already starting to be around and the beginnings of these go all the way back in the 15th century and independently the knuckle rings and the knuckle, no, sorry, the finger rings and the knuckle bow um, are both starting to appear very early on in the 15th century and to some extent something that would commonly these days in hemocircles circles be called a side sword was already around by the year 15, um, 1450. Um, there about the 1450s, things that we would term side swords were already around by the middle of the 15th century. And by the end of the 1400s, pretty much this, this sword, absolutely you could date to 1500 to 1505, which when you think about it is 30 years. That's a generation earlier than Marozzo or Manchelino were writing their treatises. Um, so we often think of side sword as kind of almost beginning in the 1530s with Morozzo and Manchelino. It didn't. It must have begun, at least the swords must have begun, all the way back in about 1500 or the late 1400s, probably 1480. Morozzo was born in 1484, and it's entirely possible that when Morozzo was a child in the 1490s, that these swords were already in common use and fencing systems associated with them were already in common use. Or was it that the fencing systems evolved quite a bit in that time? We don't know because we don't have many treatises from that time. So it's entirely possible that while these swords were around looking exactly like this by the year 1500, it's possible for all we know that between 1500, so there, uh, Morozzo and Manchelino's teacher who was called De Luca, 
in his time, it's possible that while these swords looked like this, it's possible the system was a little bit different and looked a little bit more medievalish still. So maybe there was an evolution of system that didn't run at exactly the same pace as the evolution of sword designs. I hope that's been interesting and um, if you've got more information, examples from art or anything else to share underneath I'm always happy to read your comments. Um, if you haven't liked and subscribed the channel already then please do and I'll see you really soon for another video. Cheers folks! Thanks for watching, we've got extra videos on Patreon, please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks!